Okay, we come now to Groundwork Chapter 3. I am not going to go really in-depth into Groundwork Chapter 3. The reason why is that to really understand what's going on in this chapter, you have to know a lot about Kant's wider work. And to give you a uh, sense of how much that would entail, I'm going to go get all of Kant's other works. There we go. You have Practical Philosophy, which is a collection of ethical works. One very small part of this is the book we've read, or we're reading. Um, let's find that, yeah. About this much, right? The rest of it is all his other ethical work. Then you have his probably most famous work, though not most widely read because it's a terrible book and nobody ever likes to read it, The Critique of Pure Reason. You have The Critique of Judgment. I don't have the fancy Cambridge version of this, which I feel bad about, but um, uh, you've got his work on logic and on religion. You've got all sorts of stuff here. You don't want me to go into all this, not only because that's a ton of stuff, but also because to understand what's going on in all that stuff, you have to understand a lot about what happened in philosophy from roughly the year 1600 to 1800. You have to understand a lot of debates that there is a whole class um, on. Uh, history of modern philosophy is normally taught so that it ends with Kant, where Kant is sort of wrapping up all the loose ends of the history of modern philosophy, which, believe it or not, is 1600 to 1800. I'm not going to be able to get into all of it. I don't want to get into all of it. You don't want me to get into all of it. But there is stuff that you need to think about in Groundwork 3. Because Groundwork 3 is all about the relationship between the following three things. Freedom, rationality, and morality. Basically, Kant thinks these three things stand or fall together. He thinks if we are rational, right, if we have genuine rationality um, and genuine practical rationality, if we're able to be rational beings when it comes to how we behave, then we are subject to the demands of morality and vice versa. If we're subject to the demands of morality, we must be rational. But he thinks the only way it could be true that we are rational is if we have freedom, if we have freedom of the will. And rationality is enough to show that we have freedom of the will. But if um, you have these double arrows going between these two, that means you also have double arrows going between these two. These concepts all stand or fall together. If we are rational, then we must be free and we're subject to moral rules. If we're subject to moral rules, we have to be rational and free. And the reason for this is that Kant accepts the principle ought implies can. If it's the case that you ought to do something, it must be possible for you to do it. Which means whatever the moral law tells you you have to do, whatever the categorical imperatives say you have to do, it has to be possible for you to do that. And if it's possible for you to do that, it also has to be possible for you to fail to do it, presumably. Right? Otherwise, it's not a command. It's just describing how you behave. So for any moral rule, it has to be the case that you can do it. And it has to be the case that you can't. Right? It has to be the case that it's up to your choice. So for morality to have to apply to you, it has to be the case that you can, when faced with a moral decision, go one way or the other. So that connects freedom and morality. What connects freedom and rationality is a much more complicated story for Kant. Um, but it's vital because all along, as he's been developing his moral theory, it's all been focused on reason and rationality as opposed to right, desire. Now, this is not all that unfamiliar. Plato and Aristotle seem to have some kind of contrast like this in mind. For Plato, it was reason versus appetite. 
for Aristotle, it was reason versus uh, the sensitive or perceptual nature. But that was where you know most of your desires came from. The difference is that for both Plato and Aristotle, reason, the rational part of your soul, was directed towards certain ways of life, certain goods. In a sense, reason had its own desires. So Plato wasn't saying it was reason versus desire. He was saying it was reason versus appetite, where appetite had desires, but so did reason. Appetite would lead you towards uh, food, sex, pleasure in general. Reason would lead you towards, well, the desire to contemplate the forms. Um, reason would lead you towards um, fine and good actions. Similarly with Aristotle, our perceptual nature is the nature we share with animals. But Aristotle would have thought we have plenty of desires that animals don't have, so you can have rational desires. But for Kant, the contrast is much more stark. There's what you desire, and there's rationality, and the two don't overlap. Rationality doesn't direct you towards trying to achieve certain things or get certain things or to live a particular kind of life. For Kant, there's not going to be a um, single rational life, right, with certain kinds of activities that you engage in. Like um, for Plato and Aristotle, they both seem to think that some kind of detached contemplation was part of what every rational being wants. Well, for Kant, rational being can want all sorts of things. Your desires can be for anything, and they don't have any impact on how rational or moral a person you are. Remember that Kant thinks the person who doesn't actually enjoy helping others, but manages to do it anyway, is just as good, if not better, than the person who really enjoys it, who has a desire to help other people. Whereas for Aristotle, that would have been out, right? You're not a virtuous person if you don't take pleasure in doing the right thing. For Kant, it almost seems the reverse, but if, even if it's not the reverse, even if he doesn't think you're not virtuous if you enjoy it. He definitely thinks it is no problem for you being a good person that you don't actually desire to be a good person because reason can motivate you apart from desire. How can it do that? Um, the answer is going to be freedom of the will because here's what Kant thinks. Kant believes in this contrast between the phenomenal world and what he calls the noumenal world. The phenomenal world is the world as it appears. The noumenal world is the world as it truly is. The phenomenal world is the world of physical things. Um, so here's a can of Sprite Zero, here's a mouse, computer, um, here's my hand sanitizer. These are all physical things. They occupy certain uh, regions of space. Uh, they also occupy certain regions of time, right? They're in in uh, 100 years ago, none of those three things existed. Their fundamental components did, their fundamental like atoms did, but like they didn't, the atoms weren't arranged that way. And in another 100 years, um, none of them will exist. I mean, maybe the bottle of hand sanitizer will exist in 100 years, unless somebody like recycles it and melts it down or something like that. But they occupy a certain region of space and time. They obey certain physical laws. Right? The law of gravity right? falls. If you were able to measure that, you would have seen Galileo was right. Um, they uh, react in certain ways to like electricity and heat, and all of which would be described in physics. Here's what Kant thinks. The world of space and time, the world of physical things and the physical rules and the laws and all that kind of stuff, all the laws of science, laws of nature, and all the things that they apply to, they're all part of the noumenal world. They're all part of the world as we experience it, because here's what he thinks happens. There's the world as it really is. And you are in some kind of contact. You're affected by that world. But your mind has to provide a structure for the world as it is, in order for you to make sense of it. One of the things your mind does is it takes the world as it is, which Kant thinks is fundamentally not spatial and not temporal, and it forces the world into a spatial and temporal um, mode of presentation. 
Right? So you might have heard physicists say before that time isn't real, but it's just the way we ex we experience the world. Not all physicists believe that, but plenty of physicists do. They think really the world as it truly is, there's no such thing as time. It's just that our minds take in the world and put it into a temporal order because our mind isn't able to make sense of the world any other way. Kant thinks that's true, but he thinks that's also true of space. In fact, Kant was one of the first people to have this idea that our mind forces a temporal order of events on the real world. He also thinks it forces a spatial ordering of objects on the real world, on the real world. But he also thinks causation, right? And all the laws of physics are fundamentally about causation. That's also um, something our mind forces the world to do. Right? Um, the world of physical things is in some sense a kind of illusion. And maybe illusion is too strong a word because it's not like we're making up stuff. It's just we're forcing the world to be more orderly and easier to understand than it really is. Luckily, we're all doing this together. We're all imposing the same rules on the world. So we're all experiencing it as spatial or temporal. We're all experiencing it as obeying the laws of physics. And so we can have science and we can have all the good things that come from science from understanding the phenomenal world, the world as it appears, the world as our mind forces it to appears, appear. Now, there's a whole argument for this um, that I'm not going to get into. The argument is this book. Very big book. The worst written book in the history of philosophy. No joke. I once took a class on this book. We spent the entire semester on just this book. We got about that far. Wait, no. Start here and go... Yeah, we got about that far. A little bit more. Not much. It's a terrible book. I'm not going to explain everything that happens in that book to you. If you want to know why Kant thinks this, take a history of modern philosophy class. But just know that he thinks it. Because here's the thing that's going to be important for understanding what Kant thinks about freedom. The work desires are all part of the phenomenal world. Because your body is part of the phenomenal world. I mean, if space and time aren't really real, if they're only features of the phenomenal world, if they're only features of the world as our mind forces us to experience that world, then our bodies aren't really real. Because it doesn't make any sense to think that you have a body if there's no space. Right? Um, it doesn't make any sense uh, because your body is necessarily something that takes up space. It also is something that necessarily exists at moments. It changes over time. And also, there's large parts of your mind that just don't make sense in abstraction from the body, right? Like, you've probably heard this idea before that maybe your body isn't real, right? Maybe the world that you're seeing is an illusion, matrix-type stuff. And some people say, what if the whole physical world isn't real? But if the whole physical world isn't real, it's hard to make sense of what your desires are, right? Like, imagine you woke up from the illusion. Like, you wouldn't have almost any of the desires you actually feel yourself having, right? Like try to make sense of your desire for food if you don't have a body. Try to make sense of your thirst if you don't have a body. Um, try to make sense of your desire for like excitement and adrenaline and things like that if you don't have a body. None of those desires make sense anymore because they make essential reference to your body. And so it's not just your body. It's also parts of your mind that you're experiencing as part of the phenomenal world. As part of the world, as your mind forces you to experience it, you experience your own internal mental life in a temporal way. Like one desire follows another, follows another, follows another. And so the desires you have are only features of you as the world appears to you. They are not features of the real you. And so... The part of you that's most real, the part of you that's most genuinely you, can't have desires in it. It can only have rationality. And so for Kant, freedom is a matter of rationality over desire, not pursuing rational desires rather than irrational desires, as Plato and Aristotle would have had it, but rationality controlling your desires. 
his thought is once you understand what the world's really like, you're going to know, right? Or you're going to uh, realize that the desires you have aren't going to be genuine expressions of who you are. They're part of the sort of illusion that your mind makes. And another way you can see that is your desires and large portions of your psychology are following all the physical laws. Right? I mean, you think about it this way. We, when we explain why certain people have desires, like let's say someone has um, a compulsion to scratch themselves, right? And we figure out we can give them a certain kind of drug to stop them from doing that, right? It'll get rid of that compulsion. Or people have manic episodes and we give them lithium and things like that. What we're recognizing is that there are certain desires you have, which are just chemical things up in your brain. Um, we also have all sorts of, um, not like ironclad physics rules, but lots of things that we know from psychology about how people come to have the desires they do. I mean, think about phobias and all the studies there are on how people develop phobias. Well, what are phobias except for really strong desires to not be in the presence of certain things? Right? The desires we have, we have because, and here I'm going to go back to something I mentioned before, because of all those descriptive laws, the laws of fundamentally physics, because if it's your brain doing it, well, your brain is made out of certain cells, and those cells are made out of certain chemicals, and those chemicals are made out of certain atoms, which obey certain rules coming from physics. At the end, it's all physics at the bottom. Right? So here's the question. If all there was was your desires, then all there is is the part of you that obeys the laws of physics, obeys the descriptive laws, the same way everything else does, right? Like every last aspect of this little stylus that I used to write on this Blackboard program obeys the laws of physics. If I drop it, it's going to fall every time. It doesn't have any choice about it, right? The laws force it to do what it does. Now, more complex things We'll have a wider range of behaviors you'll you can observe it engaging in. So, like my phone, because it is way way more complex than the stylus. There's all sorts of different things that you can observe it doing, but everything it does, it does because of facts about how electricity behaves in circuits. There's nothing more to it than that. Plants, right? It's not like trees choose to grow. Trees grow because that's the way they're built. Right? The cells. Um, have to do certain things because of facts about chemistry, which are in turn true because of facts about physics. And because of that, the tree is just going to grow. And even plants that seem like they're responding to the environment, like sunflowers that trace their, the sun across the sky, that's all just physics. It's super, super complicated. So complicated that we probably don't know all the details quite yet. But nonetheless, nobody really takes seriously the idea that like this, the sunflower is choosing to watch the sun. Right, with its non-eyes. Yeah. Um, so here's what Kant thinks. If every last aspect of us, if every last part of us obeyed the physical laws that are true of the rest of the natural world, then we wouldn't have any freedom. Right? We would just have desire. And if we just had desire and we didn't have, um, and, or if we just had desire and so all we did was follow the laws of physics, if the laws of physics predicted exactly what we would do all the time, then we wouldn't be autonomous because we wouldn't be giving ourselves the law. The laws would be coming from outside of us. The same laws govern us that govern everything else. Everything that we think doesn't have any choice about what it does. And so, what, while it seems like we can do lots of things right, when we're faced with the decision, if all we have is our desires, if all we have is our physical body, Right. If that's all there is to us, then we don't really ever have choices, Kant thinks. We might not know ahead of time what we'll choose, but whatever we end up choosing, we'll be choosing because of facts about electricity and chemistry inside our brains that made us go one way rather than another. And if that's true, then whenever we do the wrong thing, we couldn't have done the right thing. And so morality doesn't apply to us. So freedom has to involve rationality as opposed to desires because our desires are governed by descriptive laws rather than prescriptive laws. And if that's the case, then morality doesn't apply to us. And this can explain what can seem otherwise a puzzling thing about Kant, 
which is that he says, because we are free, because we have freedom of the will, because there's an aspect of us, our rational aspect, the rational part of our mind, because we're, uh, we're free, so that means there's a rational part of our mind that controls our behavior. And because we're free, we have to obey these rules, the categorical imperatives. And that has seemed odd to people for a long time. It's like, wait, if I'm free, why do I have to do this? Because Kant says the only alternative to obeying these rules is to just go with your desire. Um, it's either reason, in which case he's, takes, he's taken himself to have made the argument that if you're being rational, you're doing what these rules say, right? because that's just what rationality is. It's either reason or it's desire, or as he puts it, autonomy, the life where you're living rationally, or heteronomy, which is, um, here, I'll do that too. Uh, so, here. sorry about that. So, heteronomy comes from nomos just as much, but instead of um, auto, you have hetero, which just means different than, so something different than you, right? something different than the self. You either have the laws coming from within you, or you have the laws coming from um, outside of you. And that's what he thinks living by desire is. It's being ruled by these things that aren't really you, that are they're just part of the phenomenal world, the world as it's constructed, right? as opposed to the world as it really is, um, as opposed to you as you really are. Right? And so either you can be autonomous, you can give yourself the law, or you can be heteronymous, and you can accept, basically, the laws of physics as guiding you. Because what Kant thinks is whenever you just do what you desire, that's the laws of physics guiding you. And that's all there is to it. You're acting like an animal, or a plant, or a phone, or a rock falling from the sky. Right? You're a more complicated, or the story of how the laws make you do what you do is more complicated if you're living by desire, but it's not fundamentally different. But if you're living by reason, if you're overcoming your desire, then you're truly free. But rationality means following these rules, because remember, Kant says, if you're being rational, you're not being directed at any particular object. That's what desire does. Desire directs you at certain kinds of activities in particular, or certain kinds of objects in particular. Reason doesn't. Because Kant doesn't think there's any such thing as rational desires, that means all that's left is, as he said, the form of the law or universality. And all that's left is recognizing that other people are free just like you. And so there's humanity as a constraint on your behavior and the laws that you all agree to in the kingdom of ends. So what Kant thinks is if you're free, you're going to be accepting these rules and living by these rules. And anything other than that is you being unfree. The alternative to being moral isn't being um, free and immoral. When you're, when you're acting immorally, you're giving in to the unfree parts of you, the desiring parts of you. Now, because you always have the option of overcoming your desire, you're still in a sense free, but you're not using your freedom properly. You're willfully choosing to do the thing that's beneath you, right? Um, you can think of it like, um, I mean, People have, and I think, I believe Kant has, compared it to willingly choosing to live like an animal. You have the ability to be more, but you willfully choose to be less. That's what Kant thinks is involved in being immoral. Immoral is a kind of denial of your true self. Because the true you is free. Because the true you is not this body. The true you is not any of this stuff. Because none of this stuff is fundamentally real. What's fundamentally real is your mind and a whole bunch of stuff you don't know about, right? Because you only experience the phenomenal world. Now, there's this big complication to this, which is that Kant thinks we can't actually know anything for sure about the noumenal world, the real world. Kant thinks we're fundamentally cut off from it. We can only understand the phenomenal world. We can't understand the noumenal world. So a lot of what's going on in Groundwork Chapter 3 is him saying we can't know for sure that we are free. But if we're going to behave as though we're rational beings, we're going to have to act as though we are, right? Um, 
the big point is that these three things go together. Uh, there's no such thing as rational immorality for Kant. Immorality is a matter of surrendering to your non-rational impulses, and that's it. And as rational as you might think you are in figuring out a clever way to get what you want, you're really just acting like a machine where the desires are your programming. So real, true freedom and rationality go along with morality. So that's Kant's third chapter of the groundwork. Um, you might have noticed I moved much quicker through groundwork two uh, than I did groundwork one, and I moved much quicker through groundwork three than I did groundwork two. Um, part of that is just not having the Kant section of the course sprawl out too much, but part of it is also to fully understand what's going on in groundwork three, you do need a lot more background in the history of modern philosophy. A class I encourage you to take, just like I would encourage you to take the history of ancient philosophy to really get a fuller understanding of Plato and Aristotle. But this is going to wrap up uh, Kant. We're going to be moving on to our next author, John Stuart Mill.